Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much indeed for uh, turning out in force to this, the second event in ARI City series. Um, if I may, I'd just like to say a very few words about how this series came about. Um, our interest began at World Economic Forum in 2011 when I was kindly asked to chair a panel discussion on urban infrastructure. And having discussed uh, the outcomes of this session, we all felt that there was insufficient attention being paid to urban development and urban management by many policymakers and donors, uh, despite an, uh, an abundance of outstanding research, some of it produced by uh, guests here tonight. Um, now, in many quarters, it seemed to us that urban issues, as it were, were being ignored altogether. Um, in other quarters, the majority of urban inhabitants were being ignored altogether. And in others still, attention was firmly focused on big infrastructure development and exclusive property development. So, uh, from our position as non-experts, we set out... Uh, to contribute to the promotion of an awareness about the nitty-gritty and the realities of life uh, in sub-Saharan Africa's towns and cities, which, as all of you know, are growing extremely rapidly on the whole. Um, and we were particularly interested in the realities for the majority, again, those living in informal settlements, uh, who were largely marginalised economically and socially, uh, and uh, among whom poverty rates remained extremely high. Now, our first publication uh, on an urban topic um, was produced by Debbie Potts, and the focus was on data and the use of data to do with urbanisation. Um, following that, uh, in May of this year, I had a meeting uh, with Vanessa's colleagues, Nancy Odendahl and James Dumini at the African Centre for Cities. And it is that meeting that led on to this series uh, that we're currently running. Um, the first event, which a number of you here tonight kindly attended as well, um, was led by Stephen Beresford from the African Centre for Cities and Patrick McCausland, uh, both acknowledged experts on planning law. Um, in his counterpoint, <coughs> how to make planning law work for Africa, uh, Stephen argues for a radically different approach to planning law reform <coughs> in Africa as a crucial component to more sustainable and equitable urban development. Now, he and Patrick are in the course of producing the first Urban Legal Guide, another initiative of the African Centre for Cities, which will be launched at uh, next year's World Urban Forum in Medellin in, in uh, Colombia. And the aim of that Urban Legal Guide is, and I quote, to summarise and explain the scope and content of urban law, how to create it, and its importance in creating and implementing an efficient, effective and equitable system of urban governance in sub-Saharan Africa. Now tonight, uh, the focus <coughs> shifts to urban planning and specifically the education and training of planning professionals. I would like to extend an extremely warm welcome to our expert speakers who will lead the discussion, Professor Vanessa, Vanessa Watson, uh, is a Professor of City and Regional Planning at the University of Cape Town. She's also a founder and member of the Executive Committee of the African Centre for Cities, uh, which is producing some of the most important and most fascinating uh, research on urbanisation in Africa. And she's also very kindly penned Who Will Plan Africa's Cities uh, in ARI's Counterpoint series. I'd also like to welcome Professor Peter Ngao, who is the Director of the Centre for Urban Research and Innovations at the University of Nairobi. Now, 
our speakers are also have uh, something else in common, in addition to being planners and planning educators, they are key figures in the Association of African Planning Schools, uh, which is a, a network of uh, planning education institutions across the continent, now numbering more than 50. Uh, and I'll say no more about AAPS uh, because I may be treading on Vanessa's, uh, Vanessa's toes. Um, it's, I'm especially grateful that both our speakers are here tonight because they seem to have quite extraordinarily hectic schedules. Uh, poor Vanessa was only in the UK about 10 days ago and has come back for this. Peter has just been in the States for 10 days and has come over for this. And uh, really to have uh, two such leading figures with us tonight, I think is, um, we are all most grateful. Now, Vanessa is going to give an, uh, an overview of uh, the state of planning education and what uh, can be done and what needs to be done to reform and revitalise planning education on the continent. And Peter will then be speaking about planning education, uh, most specifically in, in Kenya, but also uh, the East African region. Um, of course, looking at Kenya now is particularly interesting because you have devolution occurring, and you have uh, everybody waiting with bated breath for the new uh, uh, Nairobi uh, City Master Plan, um, whose architects, I believe it's right, have <coughs> refused to make any formal mention of informality and what should be done about informality. Um, so we're very much looking forward to uh, Peter's uh, presentation. And he is also very kindly... Uh, collaborated with us to produce for town and country, which um, uh, to, is being launched today, and I thoroughly recommend a, a close read. Now, before we start, um, a few words of thanks, um, especially to Hannah Gibson from ARI, who worked with Peter and his colleagues in Nairobi, and also with uh, the heads of a number of civil society organisations and with planners. Um, and uh, 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 collaborated to produce um, this publication. Um, I, I must add that if anyone needs any passage translated into beautiful Kiswahili, she can do it. Um, I'd also like to thank the rest of the team, Jonathan and Ben and Melanie and Paulette outside, because everything we produce here is very much a team effort. Um, and I would have to say, in this instance, with these two publications, it's also been a real pleasure <laughs> and, and very easy. Uh, and also to thank our benefactor um, and chairman of our trustees, Richard Smith, who makes all this possible uh, and is sadly uh, not able to be with us tonight. Um, I'd also like to welcome and thank Jacinta Milo, who is a graduate of the system, of the planning education system in Nairobi, and is now um, working uh, with Peter in the uh, Centre for Urban Research and Innovations. And if anyone wants a bird's eye view of what it is like to go through the system and what should be altered, I'm sure Jacinta would be more than happy to speak to you afterwards. Now the format is that uh, we'll have the presentations and then uh, the floor is open and um, we'll carry on uh, fielding comments and questions and observations for as long as the speakers have the energy to field them and uh, as long as you have the enthusiasm to put them. Um, for those who are tweeting, uh, the hashtag is Urban Africa, and we are at Africa Research. And with that, I'd like to thank you all again for coming, and hand over straight away to Vanessa. Well, perhaps I can start by thanking Edward and his team profoundly for firstly finding us um, and secondly doing a, quite a remarkable job in turning our text into uh, really glamorous and well laid out publications that seem to have gone around the world remarkably quickly so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we're very happy to find you and you find thank us you. <laughs> um, I have a powerpoint somewhere I'm also delighted to see this kind of <coughs> turnout of people with an interest in planning education in Africa, which is uh, not something I would have thought there was a, a, a very wide interest in, but that, that certainly is gratifying. 
<laughs> Sorry. The bracket's not responding. It will. It will? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's been tested, of course. It has. <laughs> well done. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to start off by giving a brief background to some of the challenges um, faced by African cities. And I know it's very common for people who do this to start with a, with a litany of ills and disasters. Um, and it's quite hard not to do that because the, uh, the picture of what is going on in African cities and what is likely to go on is, is rather bleak. But to, to run through what I think are some of the key issues which planners, uh, planning educators and planning students um, do face and will have to face, let's just remind ourselves um, about the, the key issues that, uh, that are there. Um, and the first and probably the most important uh, for many countries is uh, urbanization without industrialization. Um, a feature of resource-driven economies, um, the results um, being large numbers of people moving into cities, um, but without the commensurate uh, job uh, formation, income formation, and so on. And uh, as a result of that, many people... Uh, very many people living in African cities um, without formal jobs, uh, without the income to house themselves, uh, without access to services and, and so on, and high levels of poverty. And I think this is all fairly widely known. The extent and rate of urbanization has been much debated, and those of you who came to Debbie Potts's presentation will know that there is quite some debate about that is very uneven across the continent. Um, it is a case of many people moving into middle size and smaller towns rather than necessarily into the mega cities. Um, but certainly there is urbanization. People are moving in um, and they're moving into cities that are simply unable to respond in terms of, of jobs, housing, services, and so on. So we have these kinds of figures, 43% of the urban population below the poverty line. Um, that is, that's extreme. 63% of jobs informal, 62% living in slums, highly uneven across the continent. So those are, are generalizations. We, we have to recognize that. And the inevitable result of people moving into cities rapidly um, into cities where the resource base is, uh, is, is, is very constrained. Um, the inevitable result is then a lack of much of the key urban infrastructure uh, which cities need to, to function effectively and, and efficiently. And very little prospect uh, of, of early catch-up given the rate of population growth and the tax base uh, that so much of these cities is, is generating. We have some uh, relatively newer uh, 
processes taking place, which are I think have uh, I think haven't been around for for some time, and that is a rapidly growing middle class, again unevenly across the continent. Um, but a growing middle class in turn places a whole set of new demands on urban space, on urban infrastructure, on road networks, for example, and so on. So. Uh, positive, perhaps, in some senses, but uh, placing growing demands on, on already stretched cities. And then, as we know, a high level of vulnerability to environmental risks and disasters, um, the vulnerability to impacts of climate change, and vulnerability to a whole range of risks, like uh, food insecurity uh, and so on. In, to top it all, I said I wasn't going to start with a litany of ills, but it's sounding like it. Um, and again, very unevenly across the continent, but, but threats to political stability, um, which comes and goes, ethnic divides are still there, and so on. So, so planners in Africa certainly um, have their work cut out for them, we might say. Now, there's, a, there's an even more recent source of, of tension in, in African cities, um, which I think we've only really picked up in the last, the last couple of years. And, and that is a, it's a, it's a growing interest by many global north property development companies um, in African urban land. And in almost any of the big cities in Africa, which you look at these days, you will find on some other property development website um, an image for a world-class uh, transformation of, of this particular city. Now, this bottom graphic, believe it or not, is a plan for Kigali, the capital of Rwanda, um, drawn up by an American architectural firm and this is not just fantasy, you think it might be, but this has been adopted by the Rwandan parliament um, and is in the process of being implemented. So if you go to Kigali today, you will find um, shacks being moved out, um, poor people being moved out of the city in order to uh, replace the built environment with these, um, these kinds of forms. You may recognize some familiar shapes in the background there. So this, this struggle for well-located urban land, I think, is, is a new and, and very worrying stress in, in African cities. Um, this new interest of, of global capital in, in African land and, and what stresses and strains that will place on, on African cities that are often completely unprepared uh, for these, these kinds of, of ideas. Right, well... Given all that, is there a role for planning in, in African cities? And I think if, if I'd asked that question some 10 years ago, the answer from many development agencies and even from many politicians would have been absolutely no. So planning went through a period uh, right the way through the 1990s and 2000s where there was a fairly firm belief that the market would sort out the problems of, of cities, and all we had to do was to wait for the market to, to, to take effect. I think that changed after 2008, um, and since then there has been a, a revival, I think, not only in Africa, but broadly, more broadly as well, in the global south, um, that some kind of state intervention is certainly necessary in order to sort out um, problems such as, such as these. I think the UN Habitat's uh, global report in 2009, which was on planning, was, was a clear marker of, of that shift. Um, and certainly from, so from the end of the 2000s, planning was back on the agenda. And I think it would be fair to say now that, uh, that planning is seen as, as one of the key tools of government, um, not only in Africa but elsewhere, uh, which can be used to address the, the range of issues um, which I started with. There, there, is, there is clear acceptance um, that while planning in principle uh, is an important um, thing to have, the existing planning systems and the way the existing planning systems operate is deeply problematic. So I, I think there is a recognition 
that uh, planning is good, but the systems through which that operates will, will have to definitely be reformed. Well, it's one thing to have a revival of interest in planning, and it's an important next step to get the planning systems working properly, um, but then we still need the human capital to, to work those, those planning systems. And this is where we come to planning education, um, and the institutions which produce um, planning professionals. Who is going to undertake that task? So the question is, given the training, the education of planners um, on the continent today, are they prepared, are they trained um, to be able to take on those kinds of, of issues uh, which I started with? Now, planning education in Africa takes place um, within universities. There are many undergraduate and postgraduate um, planning programs operating. Uh, again, very unevenly, some countries have many planning schools. Nigeria, I believe, has 36. You can't find out the names of all of them, but I believe they're there. Uh, South Africa has 11. Um, some countries have no planning schools at all. Angola trains no planners. DRC um, with Kinshasa, which is destined to become one of, of Africa's mega cities, does not train planners at all. So highly uneven across, across the continent. The universities themselves um, have, for the last 20 or so years, had their budgets cut, their resources diminished, and many planning schools on the continent operate under a condition of <coughs> severe resource constraint. Um, insufficient staff, poorly paid, large numbers of students, uh, poor resources, um, poor networks, and so on. So, so looking at um, planning schools in Africa, and again it's uneven, um, but it is not doing terribly well. Now I'm moving on to talk now about the association of, of African planning schools. Um, this was a network that started, it's now some 14 years ago, when a small group of us decided that it, it was time to try and shift the nature of planning education um, on the continent. There was a recognition at the time that um, in many schools, and Peter will talk more about this, uh, planning curricula were outdated, um, inherited from colonial times very often, still teaching about garden cities and uh, uh, those sorts of things. Um, and students were simply not being prepared to address issues of informality, climate change, and, and the key contemporary issues of the 21st century African city. So the project of this network um, was to revitalize planning education. And it started off, and for the first several years, was purely a voluntary network, uh, simply a, a group of ever-growing schools that kept in touch through, through email and a listserv. Um, and over the years it has grown. It is now uh, 50 planning schools and grows almost by the month. Um, and I'll show you a map in a moment as to where, where we are located. We span Lusophone, Francophone, Anglophone, Africa. Um, and uh, finally, in 2008, with funding, um, particularly from the Rockefeller Foundation, um, we have become a, a very vibrant and, and very active network. We have formed partnerships and MOUs with some important global agencies and bodies. Uh, Slum Dwellers International is one of our key partners. Um, UN Habitat, and particularly their Global Land Tools section. WeGo, which is a global network of informal workers and GPN, which is the overarching body which coordinates planning schools across the globe. Um, that's where we're located. There's our website um, address at the bottom there. You will see there's some <coughs> parts of the continent that um, certainly have big clusters of, of red, and others that have very little. 
Um, there are probably in total, and we're not sure, probably about 70 planning schools in Africa as a whole, and we think we have some 50 in, in the network. So we're getting, I think, close to, to saturation point. So the question we asked when we began this project was, was are planners being adequately trained? And from research, from visits to schools, um, from bringing people together to workshops and discussions, I think we can fairly confidently say that, that in large part, they are not. Um, and the, the reasons and factors, I think, are, are not too hard to find. And the, the key one is outdated curriculum. Um, curriculum not updated for 20, 30 years sometimes. Uh, textbooks that are from the 1950s and 60s. Um, poor access to, to new ideas, poor access to conferences and all kinds of things that go on that in universities here we, I think we, we, we take for granted. A particular problem of both planning educators and, and head students being stuck in this belief that Global North planning is also good for Africa. And all we have to do is take best practice texts and ideas um, from Europe and the States and the UK and um, implement them in Africa and, and all will be good. And I'm afraid that is very, very far uh, from the truth. But a particularly important um, obstacle to curriculum reform has been this last bullet point here. And that is a belief that planning students should be trained to implement the planning laws and systems that, that are in place in any country. Now, if any of you were here for Stephen Beresford and Patrick McGorslin's talks a couple of weeks ago, um, you would have been convinced, I think, that in very many countries in Africa, um, the national planning laws and systems are highly problematic. They, in turn, are largely inherited from <coughs> colonial powers, um, have been only marginally updated uh, since, and are really aimed at a, at a, at a city <coughs> that in, in a certain time and place may have been appropriate, but are completely irrelevant. To, to what is going on in African cities uh, today. Technocratic, uh, top-down, um, ignoring issues such as informality and poverty and so on. So, so we really have this chicken and egg problem, okay, with the, the planning laws um, still in place uh, from a previous era, um, largely inherited from, from the colonial roots and very resistant to change. And, and the planning education system feeling often that it has to train students to operate these systems. So how do you get, how do you get change into, into that kind of, of vicious circle? So one of, so ARPS's projects have been two-headed in a sense. The one is to tackle uh, planning education the other has, to be, has been to use some of our funding um, to fund Stephen Beresford and Patrick McGorslin to, to try and shift uh, thinking at a national level about um, planning laws and, and systems. And I'm not sure which is harder. <clears throat> so, so what have we done to, to try and, and shift planning education? I'm assuming the... Stephen and Patrick's uh, approach is there in the document and, and you can read it. So particularly since 2008, when we finally uh, got some funding, we have been extremely busy. Um, we're a set of schools across a very large continent where travel is difficult and expensive, so we depend a lot um, on electronic communication, uh, listservs, websites, um, Facebook, email, and, and so on. That plays a very important role. We've managed to have meetings every two years um, of all the schools, and it means funding every single person to come to a central spot. Um, school Universities don't have funding to do that. And then a whole range of, of other issues. Course toolkits, 
model curricula, um, forming research clusters and trying to get people to collaborate on particular research issues, um, looking at research methods and experiential learning studios. And I'm going to come back to talk about two of those, um, those tasks which you know, I think we have seen as, as particularly uh, important. But in all of these, we've, we've tried to keep to six key themes which emerged way back in our, in our first meeting. And we saw these themes as being key for um, cities on the continent and key themes which should inform both our research and planning education. Informality, um, which is the norm in, in, in most African cities, and how do you both understand informality um, and work with the informal, both informal housing and informal work, uh, in order to improve conditions. Um, spatial planning and infrastructure, and how do those two come more closely together? Access to land, and land is a, a very difficult issue uh, in, in African cities. What we call actor collaboration, which is participation, uh, the role of civil society, if you like. And then it's the climate change environmental issue. So th those have been our kind of key driving interests um, across across all our work, and they, those themes have been very robust over, over the years. Our funders, Rockefeller Foundation, and more recently, Cities Alliance, um, who we are now working quite closely with as they fashion their new African urban uh, research agenda uh, over the next 10 or so years. Um, let me talk a little bit about our studios, because those have been amazing. We signed an MOU with Slum Dwellers International back in, in 2010 uh, at, a, at an all schools meeting, um, inspired in many ways by work that Peter and Gala had already been doing with, with SDI in, in Nairobi. And we saw, the, uh, we saw the collaboration with SDI which has um, uh, affiliates in, in many of the informal settlements in, in African cities, as a way of exposing students to, to what you can call experiential learning. Okay? So we believe, and I think this is quite a good pedagogic track record, to, to argue that first-hand experience for students is far more effective than many hours of chalk and talk and, and in the classroom. Um, and what we really wanted to do was to try and change students' mindsets. So what this, these studios involve is actually moving the classroom into the informal settlement, engaging students directly with poor communities um, in what we call the co-production of, of knowledge and, and ideas. Students go through a process of, of working with communities to first gather information about <coughs> informal settlements, to understand better what is going on there from the mouths of people who live in them and not from abstract statistics. Um, and then working with communities to, to understand how to upgrade, how to improve, and so on. And, and SDI make the point that no one knows better than the poor about how to live in poverty. And these are important lessons um, that we ask communities to, to give our students. Um, we've uh, we've carried out a number of these studios, collaborative studios so far, Uganda, Tanzania, two in Malawi, um, Namibia, Cape Town, there's one upcoming in Harare, um, and uh, Peter has continued to work with SDI uh, in, in Nairobi. They're, they're, they're difficult. These are not simple. Um, these, are not, these are not events you can parachute into and do a quick fix and take students out again. There's a long process of negotiating <coughs> access with communities through an intermediary like the NGO, making sure that expectations are, 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 are clear um, and, uh, and managing a very tricky relationship right the way through what can sometimes be a, a four or five month long, long studio. So these are hard to manage. They're very stressful for students. Certainly in Cape Town we've had many breaking down in tears. 
but um, incredibly rewarding in the end, completely changing the mindsets of, of students. Um, really inverting the, an understanding of who is the technical expert here, who really has the knowledge, um, and, and understanding that it is often people who are living in these settlements who really do know what life is about and what the possibilities uh, can be. Um, a couple of quotes here from our Malawian studios. Uh, one student said, the in-situ upgrading approach is one that has amazed me because it really works well because it complements the efforts of the poor to solve their own housing and settlement problems as opposed to relocating them. And another one, in our last studio we did not involve the people because we treated them as ignorant to planning issues. We developed our own solutions which aimed at eradicating the existing settlements. So here was a group of students who had been doing um, studios in informal settlements um, and, and had a complete mind shift through these uh, particular uh, kinds of experiences. So we've been very excited uh, about those. Another project which I think has been very successful has been the piloting of um, our model master's program in planning. And um, we developed at one of our all school meetings an idea of, of what should a planning program in Africa look like. Um, and collaboratively we worked out a structure and content um, at a range of scales. Um, incorporated the idea of collaborative studios as much as possible. And, uh, and really the, the bottom four points there are, are the principles that drove our thinking about planning education. Planning education has to be ethically driven. It has to be pro-poor, inclusive and sustainable. Those, those are the principles which we need to, to get across to our students. Planning education has to be contextually relevant rather than imported best practice. Um, we have to give students a good understanding of the spatial, spatial competencies, that's very important. But at the same time as being context relevant, students have to have a literacy with, with global uh, processes, ideas, and so on. So it's trying to get that global and local in, in balance. Um, we were lucky enough to be able to pilot our masters at the uh, University of Zambia in Lusaka, was, which was about to um, start planning a new master's program. Um, and we worked with them over 2012 and 2013 to put the ops program in place, which they were very accommodating and, and open to do. Um, we took one of their geography graduates and trained him as a planner in Cape Town. Um, Gilbert here graduated from UCT two weeks ago. This week he is in Lusaka teaching 17 brand new students in the Lusaka planning program about planning. So this has it's been a remarkable success as, as far as we're concerned. We told Gilbert that during his holidays he had to go back to Lusaka and set up a relationship with Slum Dwellers International so that he could run collaborative studios as soon as he started teaching. And that he did. Um, the first intake of students is there, many of them uh, people from the municipality who are being retrained, which is important. Um, and there's the, the first class uh, standing outside the offices of the affiliate of Slum Dwellers International uh, in, in Lusaka and about to embark on their first collaborative planning studio. So we've been very happy with, with that outcome. Now to finish off, what more will it take to shift planning education in Africa? <coughs> and uh, as Peter and I were saying the other day, this is a, this is a very long term project. It's an intergenerational project. It will still be going ahead beyond our lifetimes. I, I have no doubt of that. It is very slow moving. Arts needs to grow and thrive. It's, it's a fundamental tool for, for shifting planning education. But there's no quick fix, no silver bullet. Um, it's going to take a long, a long time. It will depend as well on shifting national planning legislation. 
Um, without that shift, we're going to be seriously hampered. Um, and there's still there's still some important some important obstacles uh, in the way. There's across Africa. There's there's very little in the way of a political commitment to to cities. Um, many politicians are still very focused on their rural <coughs> electorate. Um, many donor agencies are still very focused on rural development rather than urban development. Um, cities are often seen as a kind of inconvenient nuisance and are not yet taken seriously. We may look at changing planning education, but there are generations of trained planners already in, um, in the public service who would need to be retrained, and that is a massive task. To, to try and, and, and do that. And then I think there's an important question maybe for some people who are here about the role of international agencies, non-African universities, professional planning bodies. Is anyone from the RTPI here? Um, and maybe those are some questions we can take up in discussion afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, Vanessa, for that. Uh, if it's not an oxymoron, a very comprehensive introduction <laughs> to uh, AAPS and uh, uh, all the fascinating and constructive work that the organisation, the network, is, is undertaking. Um, <coughs> if I could just add to anyone who's, who's not an expert in this, uh, in this area that the, the, um, the AAPS website is thoroughly worth looking at but also the SDI website. The, um, the report of a, an enumeration done in Kampala that was posted on the 28th of November is absolutely mind-boggling. Um, so I would thoroughly recommend to, to, to anyone interested in, in reading further, um, taking a look at SDI uh, as well as the AAPS website. Um, and there's something fascinating there every week um, from across the continent. And now, um, I, I must, I, I refer to, um, to Peter as a leading figure in the AAPS. I should, out of respect, say that he is the incoming chair, to be absolutely precise. Um, if I could welcome Professor Peter Ngao. Institute, and uh, also I'm very grateful for the attendance. Um, uh, I had prepared, or my team had prepared some little movie, yeah, uh, for two minutes, Peter. and then uh, after that I will uh, give more of a conversational talk. We agreed that we will not have too many PowerPoints. <laughs> we would like to have a story instead of a PowerPoint. So I hope the machine behaves. Eh? <laughs> uh, this uh, clip, we did it uh, a few months ago um, as part of the... Um, Thank you. 
One of the statements in the beginning was Kuna uh, Matata. Those of you who know Swahili, uh, whenever you, are, you arrive in Kenya, they say Akuna Matata. It means there's no trouble, there's no problem. But uh, we prepared this clip just after the Westgate, uh, the Westgate uh, uh, terrorist attack. And we felt it was fair to actually say, there is trouble, uh, which means kuna matata. Uh, but that is part of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, uh, Vanessa, I think, has laid down a background about Africa urbanization. Uh, she has also laid background on the aspect of planning, which is uh, we are all trying to really apply as a tool to address the challenge of urbanization, and also wider poverty. So uh, the voice which uh, Africa Research Institute have published with me is more of a story, of a personal story, but it is the main call in that story is uh, that a call for inclusive development. Uh, in Africa, almost every country has a vision. We have vision 2020, 2030, 2040, and so forth. And my argument is that to achieve those visions, uh, to attain those visions, and also uh, in Africa, I think the message about uh, the future is urban is also being echoed. Uh, the effort of uh, UN Habitat, the effort of uh, Cities Alliance, they are all talking about this. And I think they are convincing many people in government that uh, the future is urban. Now, my argument is that if these visions and if these sustainable urbanizations are to be attained, we need to be to, have, to embrace inclusive development. Because I'm going to tell a story of a failure to appreciate and to uh, promote inclusive development. This is part of what we have seen here. And in a way, the alternative is actually to miss a lot of opportunity. And the alternative is also really even to try even a more unpalatable solution. I am a planner. I have been teaching planning over 30 years. Uh, I have seen planning address opportunities in my country, uh, you know, immediately after independence through the governments of uh, various presidents. Uh, but I have also seen planning being abused and therefore lose those opportunities and actually becoming a problem at some times. So as I talk about this, I'll be talking about the opportunities and challenges which are represented by one particular country in Africa, but I think this is a story which can apply to other African countries. So uh, Kenya's history has unfolded through various phases, of course, we went through colonial period, and planning, I think, it started all that way long. Uh, colonial uh, administration was very firm on planning, uh, but it was a planning for control. It was a planning for segregation. You come to Nairobi or Kenyan towns, and you can actually see the town part which was developed during colonial time, and the town part which has emerged after colonial time. The one which is which evolved during colonial time has a very clear grid system. Uh, it is very orderly. The part which has grown after independence is very organic. Uh, it has been developed by people in their sp the free spirit. Now, come to the period of uh, independence, post-independence period, and we have had experiences with different types of regimes. Uh, the, our first president was Jomo Kenyatta, as you all know, and 
the first thing, of course, the independent government did was to promote uh, freedoms, to scrap the uh, controls and some of the uh, segre uh, segregations which were uh, part of the colonial government. Now, what did that do? That freed people, especially people who are in the rural areas, who had been prevented from moving into the urban areas. There was mass rural to urban migration. Uh, of course, Kenyatta government also did da do uh, agrarian reform, distributed land, encouraged uh, smallholder farming, and the economy really picked up. There was this uh, rapid economic growth during the first two decades when Kenyatta was president. But this uncontrolled rural to urban migration created a challenge in the urban areas. Uh, it was so rapid that we, government could not provide housing, adequate housing, it could not provide adequate jobs, and therefore it became a challenge. How did the government respond? There were three aspects of response. The first one was the president actually started asking people to go back to the rural areas. He used to have a call to Rudy Mashambani, it means go back to the rural areas. And they would show them the farms which the government was distributing. He was trying to really reduce the <coughs> rural to urban migration. But the informal settlements were really forming so rapidly, the government has to have a more direct approach, and evictions and demolitions started. But there was a third response, which was planning and the modernization. Government thought that planning would be a solution by providing uh, you know, new housing estates, providing uh, you know, places for industrialization. Uh, the cities were mapped. We had this growth center and the service strategy uh, you know, document which we pulled out in the 1970s, which kind of looked at the country and saw it was mainly rural. And the planners designated towns where they would grow. And that was one of the first models in Africa. And in a way, it contributed later years to creating a balanced urban system in the country. It was at that time that uh, the government uh, actually started the School of Urban and Regional Planning, which I teach today. It started in 1971. 1974, it started uh, training masters in uh, but actually, it was not even the Kenyan government which started that school. It was East African community. At that time, it was East African community. And the three African, East African countries felt that they needed a school of planning in the entire of East Africa. And that school was put in uh, Nairobi University. Uh, that school really, later years, contributed a lot to training of, of, uh, of planners. And it helped. But again, the issue of uh, adequacy of resources uh, and the issue of uh, what I think Vanessa was talking about here, a planning which was directed at control, not facilitating, not responsiveness to the uh, you know, context in which uh, it was taking place. Um, then, of course, there was the era of more in government, 1986. Uh, through to uh, 2002, uh, this was a very difficult time for Kenya, about 24 years, 25 years. You know, uh, it was marked by a lot of constrained uh, economic circumstances. You know, you know the collapse of the commodity prices, the structural adjustment uh, uh, program which came. Um, and I think the response, of course, was uh, again more eviction from people who are living in formal settlements, more demolitions. Uh, that was a very, very uh, difficult time for Kenyans. Um, what happened was this kind of reaction now also triggered uh, organization of uh, people in the informal settlements. We started having the Federation of uh, Slum Dwellers, uh, which I think now has. Uh, grown up to be part of what we are calling uh, you know, Slum Dwellers International. Uh, many of my colleagues who we, are, we were teaching in the university were also in a dilemma. Because of the repression, because of the detentions, uh, many of them opted to go and work with the civil society organization. So we started seeing a lot of NGOs emerging. 
in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, I remember at that time, uh, uh, people like the current Chief Justice, we were teaching with him in the University of Nairobi, and uh, most of his colleagues who had, had already been detained, uh, we were playing football in 1982, uh, and after we parted from the playground in the university, I went home, and the news at seven was Mutunga Mukangi have been detained. And they were detained for seven years after that. Uh, many others ran away from the country. Uh, I didn't run away from the country. What I did is I had been doing quite a lot of work with the development partners, USID, you know, all the year that time. And uh, I was invited to work with the UN. So I joined the United Nations Center for Regional Development. I felt that because there was very little to do in the university, the education or planning was not yielding any response. Planners were more or less complacent because of the repression. Uh, maybe I could do something with the United Nations. And uh, in the United Nations, I was given the responsibility of training, or organizing planning uh, courses and programs for Africa. So it was very, very, uh, I was very, uh, you know, excited about that. I felt like what I have not, I not achieved in Kenya, I probably would achieve it Africa-wide. So I, with my colleagues in the United Nations Center for Regional Development, we started uh, what we called Africa Training Course. It was a summer course which would bring planners from all over Africa, and we had this course in Nairobi, uh, and it more or less, it was a very unique course because it was very interdisciplinary. We would bring people from development administration. We would bring people from economic uh, departments of the African countries. And we would also bring uh, people from spatial planning. Initially, they were, there was a lot of resistance from those uh, participants. They would ask us, why, why are you trying to uh, train us as administrators together with economists? Economists would detest being trained together with uh, the administrators. And the administrators would think they should not be trained together with uh, physical planners. Now, our idea was to foster interdisciplinarity. Our idea was to show that development in the context actually does not recognize those uh, disciplinary boundaries. When you are in the village, when you are in a neighborhood in an urban area, they don't, they don't know whether you are a, an architect or whether you are an engineer. They just want services. And yet, one of the challenges, which I think uh, Professor Veneta was talking about here, this compartmentalization of professions has continued so much in Africa that it becomes a problem. The surveyor will come and say, okay, I'm going to really give you my service and uh, you know, do whatever the surveyor is supposed to do and leave you hanging and then tell you, okay, next, next thing you have to do probably is <coughs> see a valuer. Then you ask, what's a valuer? And uh, uh, you go looking for the office of the valuer, and the valuer will tell you, okay, I'll come to your land and assess it to see how much tax you have to pay. And after the valuer has done their thing and given their report and charged you so much money, they will tell you, okay, now you, you go and see the planner. Uh, they have to prepare for you a part development plan and sign it. So it is this compartmentalized service provision of professionals which prevented uh, the professions in, uh, in Africa. And as today, you find it is uh, quite a, a challenge, particularly to the developers, even private developers, uh, you know, communities and so forth. So I felt uh, this is what we were trying to dilute, this is what we are trying to address in the United Nations uh, by having this uh, Africa training course. Uh, that course has run all the way from 1996 even today. When I left UN, it still continued and it continues today. And I think it has made a lot of impact because whenever I go to African countries, I see some of the alumni, they are in very good positions. And I think they do try to foster a different type of uh, you know, guidance to development. Uh, the other thing, of course, which was happening at that time is uh, back in, uh, in Kenya, there was, of course, new changes. You know, uh, the new government of Kibaki in 2000 and, uh, 
2002 came with a lot of um, you know, uh, optimism. Because after 24 years of uh, what people called autocratic leadership, uh, the new government, which came with the, uh, you know, clearly, you know, NAC, NAC government, people felt that was bringing in a lot of freedoms and would at least revive the economy. It is true that uh, the time of Kibaki from 2002 and uh, 2007 and 8 did bring some economic revival. Uh, there were a lot of innovations, I think. Uh, one of the sectors in Kenya which has uh, been part of that uh, innovation is uh, IT. Uh, Kenya is fairly ahead in terms of uh, you know, uh, IT development, um, mobile money, mobile everything. I think we have uh, one of the highest per capita ownership of mobile phones. And they are cheap, they are not as uh, expensive as here. <laughs> uh, we, we call for a penny in Kenya and uh, you know, we move money from one account to another, we pay people in the rural areas, we send friends money uh, and so forth. And I, I think it is really driving the commerce, it is driving uh, uh, social services in the country. That was one innovation which came up with the government of uh, you know, Kibaki during that time. The other innovation was in agriculture. Okay, we had you know, predominantly been a, a coffee and a tea growing country. But uh, because of the collapse of prices of these commodities in the 80s, uh, a new you know, kind of innovation emerged where we had uh, horticultural uh, crops coming up, flowers and so forth. And I think we are very happy you, you like our flowers. And uh, you know, that has really also helped to diversify the economy. Now, uh, but all the same, a very uh, you know, important challenge continued corruption. Corruption and impunity uh, did not end. Even as these innovations came, um, and, and I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm happy at least one of uh, the people who took the challenge, who challenged the corruption in Kenya is here today. Uh, and they called on the leaders, uh, challenged them. I think he suffered a lot. Uh, he must have been uh, expelled from the country or uh, something happened. But uh, that was the, the, you know, that side of, uh, the Nakun government, uh, and as a result, that development did not really reach the bottom uh, or the wider base of the society. It was merely a, an innovation and a recovery which was directed at just a few elites. And that has been the main challenge uh, through Kenya's uh, history of development, that narrow band of who actually benefits from this development. Uh, one thing which also came positively in terms of uh, Kibaki government time was the government changed attitude towards slums. Instead of uh, for, you know, fostering evictions, and uh, government announced a policy change towards slum upgrading. So we began seeing actually uh, efforts by government to come up with programs of uh, slum upgrading like Kenya Informal Settlements Upgrading Program. Um, but at the same time, there were parallel to that some aspects of eviction, administrative evictions. And usually these were because uh, people in power or positions would still use the administration to remove uh, poor people in informal settlements whenever they wanted land for their own development. So the abuse of power, the impunity, yeah, still <coughs> was part of that. Uh, I think it was at this time I came back from the UN and I joined uh, University of Nairobi again and I became the chairman. And I saw the opportunity during that time of uh, really revamping the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. Uh, we had been training about 15 planners per year. So that was not really much even from 1972. The country really didn't have planners as such. So I felt like uh, with my colleagues that we needed to have uh, a greater number of people trained as planners. So we started a bachelor's program in, uh, in planning, uh, which would uh, admit more than 30 people or so. Today we admit about 60. Uh, but I also felt that the old master's program, which we had been uh, teaching, had really become outdated in terms of content, in terms of technology. And these are some of the things, these are some of the reforms which we, we did. We tried to uh, improve the curriculum in, for our master's program. Uh, in improving the content, in improving the technology aspects of it, and also starting the new uh, bachelor's uh, program. 
Uh, I served as a, you know, as chairman of my department for seven years, and uh, after that, I realized uh, that uh, even though the numbers had increased, uh, there were still challenges. We were not really still making an impact. I felt that uh, the actors in terms of development, whether it was central government, whether it is local authorities, whether it was civil society, they lacked adequate information, and the still planners stayed off. They were more in terms of uh, uh, interested in control. Uh, the planners who were coming out would join, and they would not be seen to be part of assisting the communities. So I, I and a group of people started what we called the Urban Innovations Program. <coughs> and this was a kind of a center to uh, foster applied research, and uh, also we felt we needed to begin going out and uh, linking with the communities, linking with the civil societies. Uh, and we also felt that we needed to link up with the local authorities. So to, in order to do that, you really have to be relevant to the communities. You need to be relevant to the local authorities. So we started the co collaborations with the civil societies, collaboration with the local government, and we also started the collaboration with the external universities. And that's how I came to know uh, about the University of Cape Town. Uh, that's how I came to know and link up with the universities like uh, Columbia University in the U.S., uh, University of California, Berkeley. Now, with the civil society, uh, we started engaging in directly uh, working with the communities. Uh, civil society, of course, which started in the late 90s, they were more interested in improving conditions in the informal settlements. They would, uh, for example, champion uh, the, the provision of basic services. Uh, I think here I'm try just trying to show some of the uh, findings which we came up with. When you engage uh, civil society with, uh, with, you know, with our research, you know, info, you know, input was extremely very useful. We would provide them with some evidence of some of the things they were trying to do. And this is just a study which we did in Madare. Uh, it tried to rate, Madare has 13 villages, and it tried to rate these villages in terms of one important uh, service which all communities require, which is uh, you know, water. Now, uh, Spear Humanitarian Standard says uh, you need 250 people per water point. Now, this is what we found in Madare. Uh, even on the average, the entire Madare, way, way number of uh, people uh, <coughs> depend on one uh, function water point. And, and you can see the disparity. A few villages, you could say they are adequately or they are within the standards. Um, I think there was another one which is uh, yes, this is a, a, a pit latrine. Most of the informal settlements in, uh, in Kenya and uh, Africa, one of the worst conditions they live in and the impunity is in the area of sanitation. Uh, sanitation is very important. One one day, I think I was working in Madar slums, and this woman told me, "You know, sanitation is more important than democracy, because without it, uh, we don't know how to exist. You know, it's really a big challenge. Uh, very few <coughs> structures, we call them structures, because they are really hardly houses in the informal settlement, have any toilet in, within the structure." They rely on communal toilet, and it is usually put somewhere very far. Uh, you can't access it at night. Uh, even during daytime, it is very risky for women and for girls to go to those uh, toilets. And that's why you hear, for example, in the case of uh, Kenya, Kibera, you hear of flying toilets. This is because the people have no access to a toilet, so they have to do it inside the structure and put it in a polythene paper and throw it sometimes. Uh, so again, our studies try to show uh, what is the situation about uh, access to toilets. You know, uh, the spear standard talks of 20 persons per, uh, per latrine. Uh, look at what we found, the number of persons who have to depend on one latrine, and though it is inaccessible. Now, the importance of this kind of research is we begin to use it to communicate with government. We begin to show, for example, uh, the average of what government attains in, or wishes to attain in the government uh, plans or in the policy documents, and what is happening in this. This was very surprising to many people in government because they have no data about informal settlement. They don't know what happens there. They don't know how the conditions of deprivation. So our research was 
uh, helping the civil society to make a case with the government. And it was as a result of this that uh, uh, informal, uh, you know, civil society groups like Pamoya Trust started getting government service providers to work in the informal settlements. We started getting, like, for example, Nairobi Water Company to provide water to Madare. Uh, now, for us planners, it was very useful because for the water company to bring uh, water, they need to lay pipes. Now, many of the government organizations will say, we don't provide services in the informal settlements because there is no space, there is no organization, and our, our infrastructure is going to be vandalized. So we go there as planners and we negotiate, we, 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 you know, we engage with the community, we explain to them uh, what it will mean to surrender land to allow the pipes to pass. And they are willing to do that if they know actually what they are going to get is something which they have been looking for. So it's kind of, we felt like there was a kind of win-win uh, situation between us and the civil society. And then our students liked it so much, you know. We realized actually our students have been really looking for something practical because now they felt like they were dealing with a situation which they were familiar with, but which from a planning perspective, they had not been given an opportunity to deal with. Now, we also dealt with the local authorities. Uh, a lot of times people talk about slum upgrading. Of course, that is to address issues of existing slums. But there are more slums coming. Just as urbanization is taking place, every urban, new urban center is a potential for another slum. Because if the ratio of urban in all the urban areas is about 70%, the more urban areas we get, the more slums we get. But can we prevent it? Uh, we felt that from a planning perspective, if you really engage the managers of the new towns, it is possible to prevent slums coming up. Slums come because of the way land is organized, the way land is subdivided, uh, and if this is addressed in advance, then you prevent slums. And that's what we did when we started working with the rural municipality. We started, uh, uh, first of all, we encouraged them to hire a planner. Uh, then we talked to the you know, <coughs> municipal executives, the mayors, uh, and you know, we started talking to them about how they can organize their towns uh, and anticipate some of the things which are likely to come up. Now, I mentioned also in the you know, Urban Innovations Program, which later became a uh, you know, Center for Urban Research and Innovation, we started also uh, partnering with uh, other institutions. We started uh, you know, linking up with uh, universities outside, uh, you know, University of Cape Town. And it was in those meetings with the University of Cape Town and others in the other university that we, we started questioning the kind of education we were uh, providing with, uh, in, in Africa. And uh, that's how the idea of uh, Association of African Planning Schools came up. And we are, we are very happy that we have been part of that movement. Uh, and the main call for the APS has been basically revitalization of planning and education. Uh, and it has come a long way. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, one of the things about planning revitalization is there is always clash of perspectives. If you read the story which I have tried to write with the uh, you know, African Research Institute, I have shown how there is so much resistance, not from outside, but within the faculty itself. <coughs> the different schools of thought. The, there are planners who believe in control, uh, and they have been trained to that, and they believe that that is what should be promoted. Now, that is very different from a person who is willing to go and work with the communities, who believes that you can negotiate negotiated solutions to problems. You know, you want to build a, a road through an informal settlement. Uh, the standard says, uh, you know, 18, you know, about 9 meters uh, or 24. Um, but if you just actually take that 24, you completely erase the informal settlement because it's too wide and they are not willing to allow you to do that. They will actually resist, they will, they will demonstrate. So why not negotiate? Maybe they can do with a three meter road. Maybe they can do with a four meter road. But the books don't talk about three meter road. They say, no, no that's not acceptable. So it is this kind of perspective which uh, we have to look at in terms of our context. Uh, do we maintain those rigid standards which probably will not uh, be palatable to the local people? Or do we negotiate and look at what might, be, uh, you know, might work with them? So it is this kind of work which we have found 
is the main really point of uh, contention in our own schools. The planning faculty is divided between these two, two schools. Do, you know, from a planning which is a social engagement and uh, negotiated uh, versus a planning which is rigid, uh, which does not believe in bending standards. And in the end, when you look at these two plans, one really is exclusion, exclusionary, and the other one is inclusive. And that is where I felt like we planners have a major role to do. If we really have to promote inclusive development, we have then to bring this new change uh, in perspective. So I am basically trying to call for uh, us to continue within schools of planning, uh, from promoting these partnerships with the urban poor, uh, with the civil society, because I believe there is a solution in, the, in that kind of engagement, uh, to continue promoting a linkage and a partnership with the other African universities. The solution to Africa might not be found in the cities in the west or in the north, uh, in terms of the designs which we are seeing here, uh, I think we can have designs which are more, uh, you know, appropriate and context-based. I also believe that we need to uh, uh, accept informality and address the issues of informality and urban poverty. Uh, right now, in most of the curriculums in African planning schools, there is no single course on informality. For you actually to put a course on informality would shock some of the people. They will say, no, 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 no. What we need to do is to remove eradicated informality, and we are not there to study it, okay? So we have this kind of big debates within our schools, and they are actually part of the problem. And, and finally, of course, is the issue of poverty. How do we address poverty? Uh, right now, Africa is receiving a lot of investments. Uh, Africa has been experiencing a lot of rapid economic growth, as you know. There are a lot of resources now which, is, which are being harnessed in Africa, uh, minerals, uh, land, and so forth. But the question is, who is benefiting from this kind of development? Where is the urban poor in the equation of this? Uh, are we factoring in this important uh, segment, which is the majority? So that's why I'm calling for more inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. Absolutely fascinating and some very, very clear messages there. Um, I'm aware that uh, some of you will have to slip off. Uh, I'm thrilled that the presentations have gone on longer than I'd expected. Sorry. It's just great uh, that you, you, you gave us more. Um, so I'll just make one or two uh, uh, quick comments. For, for us, um, the publications are the, are the end of, of one process, but they're very much the beginning of another. And if I can ask for your help um, in distributing uh, these publications, which are very clear, uh, accessible to any reader, um, then you know, that help would be very much appreciated. Um, the publications are already in the process of being distributed in Africa to planning schools and, and to students through uh, networks of planning professionals. Um, Babatundi Agbola, who, uh, uh, the co-chair of AAPS, uh, who was Vanessa's co-author for Who Will Plan Africa Cities, is doing a tremendous job <coughs> circulating publications in West Africa. And I'm sad they, they can go in hard copy or in, in, in e-form. And also from tomorrow, the sound recording of this event will be on our website from next week, a short film. So do please share this with, with colleagues and friends who have uh, an interest in these, these very important issues. Uh, and we are also discussing, uh, uh, starting from this morning, about um, uh, ARI, the possibility of ARI support, supporting a, a regional event with the planning schools in East Africa, uh, with the planning schools and with the representatives of, of um, informal, uh, with of, uh, civil society organisations in the informal uh, communities. So we're very excited about that and hope that we will be able to uh, support what it, it looks like being. Um, uh, a useful and, uh, and productive follow-up to, to this evening. Um, uh, do please slip away if, if you have to. Um, we, uh, we quite understand, um, and we will carry on with, uh, with, with, with comments and questions for um, as long as, as I said before, as long as there is willing on all sides. 
Um, and I'd just like, in case a few of you do have to slip away, I'd just like to ask for a, a, a further round of applause for the tremendous presentation. <laughs> Right, if I can uh, ask for the first contribution or question from the floor uh, on the left here. If you could uh, kindly stand up, that would be very helpful so that everyone can hear. And if you could say um, your name and your affiliation, that would be very helpful as well. Thank you. Hi, um, Gareth Ball from the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Um, uh, thank you very much for the really interesting presentation. Uh, so just a question first on um, uh, barriers for, for the new things forward. I was interested. Uh, you mentioned about two schools of thought within the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, I was interested to see, uh, to get a sense from the two of you, uh, how that was spread. Are there some schools that are really progressive? Are the others that are all faulty <coughs> and not moving? Uh, 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 is it a small minority that are uh, on uh, on your side, or is it the, the majority are getting there, or, or that sort of thing? Uh, but also within the um, the planning departments, um, within the municipalities, or, or otherwise, um, the, what barriers are there to uh, older senior managers uh, that you're finding your graduates maybe coming up, up against uh, and that's, that sort of thing. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to ask was if, if you're able to um, expand a little on, you mentioned the partnerships with municipalities of, of my interest to local governments, <coughs> so what kind of partnerships do you guys have? You mentioned a one particular city that um, you were able to partner with to minimise slum developments as it was growing uh, and then you could expand. Thank you. Okay, so um, first in terms of, uh, I think, barriers to change, uh, they, they come in different forms. Uh, one, I think it is uh, in, the, in the outlook of how one sees the subject. Um, remember planning, in a way, it is um, often uh, presented as a rational profession, and uh, that rationality if you just present it in terms of strict standards, uh, can become a, a barrier. And uh, as opposed to one which is uh, co uh, contextualized in a you know, dynamic situation and uh, in a situation which is uh, m maybe uh, you know, where you have uh, high levels of uh, poverty and, uh, and so forth. So I think one is more of uh, uh, you know, educational per uh, perception and the ideological uh, meaning of uh, a person. The other one is a barrier in terms of legislation. Uh, I think Vanessa talked about uh, African uh, countries still living in uh, a period of uh, you know, legislation which comes all the way back from colonial period. Uh, the times have changed by the legislation which governs professions uh, is still very outdated. And that is the one which goes, people go by if you really follow the approvals and, and so forth. I think there is also, uh, you might also see resistance in terms of, uh, uh, in, you know, in, 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 in terms of impunity. Uh, corruption is very rampant in, in, in Africa and it becomes a barrier. Uh, what does a planner really have to do if you are given a town to plan? And the, you know, your proposals and the community, you know, interests are of a, uh, you know, they, they, they are really challenged by a person, particular person who is uh, highly connected. Uh, I had this one student I trained and he, I, he was posted in one of the towns in Kenya called Garissa. And, uh, you know, his first month, he, he was, you know, in his office, uh, a very senior person came and said, look, you know, uh, I have a parcel of land here and next to it is a, is a playing ground uh, for, for, uh, for, for the community there and I would like to, uh, to take that piece of land to expand my business. And uh, the planner said, no, no, sir, you know, this is a public space, you cannot uh, take a, a playing ground. And, uh, you know, the person was very high in the military and said, do you know who I, you are talking about, you're talking with? And he just walked out and the next 20 minutes, the director of planning from Nairobi called the young boy and said, look, what did you do, my friend? You know, you have really messed us up. Uh, we have received a call from the office of the president and the boy did not know really what was happening uh, and yet he thought he was just uh, trying to follow the, the, the principles which we had trained him that you respect public space. Now that is a major barrier in terms of uh, planning in, in Africa. 
If I just uh, quickly talk about the, what we are yeah. doing, barriers in local government. Yes, it is true. Uh, local government uh, have, and it's, it's very, very interesting that uh, in, uh, in many African countries, uh, local government are managed by town clerks. Uh, I don't know whether this is a situation here. And most of the town clerks tend to be uh, legal persons. They, they are, their training is in legal background. Uh, so when it comes to management of resources and services, they think in terms of legal aspects. They don't think in terms of social issues, in terms of uh, services and so forth. So we have found it very difficult to deal with uh, managers of uh, urban areas in, in Kenya. Because uh, when you go there as a planner, they don't actually know what a planner does. They think that all they need to do is to administer. They are there to allocate land. Uh, they allocate land according to seniority of who is asking for that land. So those are some of the barriers which we, 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 we deal with. Okay, if I can just come back to your question about the different approaches and how that varies across schools. Um, I think it's, it's probably more often differences within schools rather than being able to classify entire schools as top-down and controlling and others as not. Um, and it's very often a generational issue. I think the, the, the younger staff um, who are probably find it easier to, to be on the internet and to communicate um, have picked up more readily on, on current ideas and, and older staff often haven't. Um, so it's, I think it's hard to sort of classify entire countries or entire schools as, as one way or the other. It's, it's very much a generational, or depends on particular individuals or personalities who, who happen to have been there. Uh, hi, my name's Kerwin Datu, a website for Global Urbanist, uh, also based at LSE. Um, my question relates to something that you had up which talked about um, changing teaching or perhaps new pedagogical methods at the community level but also the citywide and the regional level and I think you both talked very much about how students were engaging at the community level but I think teaching about how to address issues of informality especially at the citywide and regional level is a big challenge and I think slum upgrading can only go so far before you have to start asking and discussing those regional questions at policy and planning levels. So can you talk a little bit about how to change the teaching of those aspects? No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean it is important that, that students understand how to plan at different scales. Um, engaging communities at a regional scale is, is, is a very different uh, issue to, to the local scale and I think at the regional scale you really are trying to identify who are the major stakeholders uh, rather than, than communities. Um, at the citywide level, I think it's very possible to, to still engage uh, with communities. And in fact, in <coughs> Uganda, where Slum Dwellers International has a five cities program, um, the NGO itself has engaged uh, across the city and uh, the planning school there has been able to, uh, to move with them um, and, and have a look at city scale uh, planning issues from a, an inclusive perspective. Um, so it, it's, uh, it, it certainly can be done at the city scale, uh, very often depending on, on an intermediary who can operate at, at that level. Regional scale, far more difficult, unless Peter's found other ways of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> The gentleman at the back. Uh, my name is Leonard Ted. I work for the UK Department for International Development. City. Two questions quickly. One on the changing role of aid as official development assistance becomes less and less significant, certainly absolute terms, in, um, around the, uh, the questions of urban finance. Um, any perspectives on uh, the changing role of aid in doing this? And secondly, on new technology and mapping in particular, as mobile uh, technology penetration becomes um, near, near complete in, in a number of the areas that, that uh, we're working in, including the urban poor, whether this represents a, a, a major um, reform in planning and approaches to planning and in inclusion of different sectors. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think in terms of uh, aid, we we went through a period when many development partners withdrew from certain countries. 
one of them was I think uh, Kenya in the uh, 90s and uh, due to the poor governance uh, but also we begin seeing uh, you know new development partners coming in uh, suddenly we have a bigger role now being played by uh, you know countries like uh, China in Africa um, what I notice is this development is coming is entering in us in aspects of uh, infrastructure development because uh, the perception in Africa is uh, uh, Africa has lagged behind in infrastructure development so there's a lot of resource uh, there's a lot of donor uh, aid coming in in support of infrastructure that is a solution in one way but it's also a challenge because such infrastructure development tends uh, to come in and a lot of times there are this insensitivity to uh, the urban poor. Uh, when it comes to road development, uh, many of the spaces where maybe roads were earmarked and they have never been built, uh, they have already been occupied by people in the through informal settlements. And rather than planners trying to really go ahead and uh, try to create uh, alternatives to people who are already living in these kind of spaces, uh, it's left for the government to come and clear those uh, spaces. I was telling uh, Andrew at here what happens is, uh, you know, organizations like World Bank and uh, DFID, they know very well their principles do not allow them to really do this kind of thing. So, but they will ask the government, can you give us a clear site? It's only when you give us a clear site you will sign the contract. Now, what does the government do? Government goes in, uh, demolishes, evicts, and then they hand over a clear site. Uh, and that is how actually a lot of evictions uh, are been taking place. It's not like to say we are, you know, one has to be against infrastructure development, but I think there is a role planners can do <coughs> and engineers and so forth to provide alternatives. Uh, we know we recently had a major superhighway built in Kenya, uh, Tika Superhighway. Now this uh, highway had do, done a lot of expansions. Uh, it ran through places which had be, become very thriving markets. Um, and we tried to argue with the uh, you know, engineers, why don't you then provide a way of accommodating this market? You know, and uh, how are you linking the transport with the land use, which is adjacent? These are very difficult things, which normally, normally don't get accommodated. But I have found that uh, if you engage uh, more through uh, you know, the various professionals who are working, uh, you can actually sometimes get a solution. The way Superhighway, Thika Superhighway was designed is not the way it was built. Uh, over time, there were a lot of enhancements which were done as a result of engagement. Yeah. Uh, yes, let me pick up on your mapping issue. Um, and certainly the technology is moving very fast and students have all kinds of um, uh, programs and, and, and ways of, of mapping that's at their fingertips that they, they never used to. But um, engaging with organisations like Slum Dwellers International, which, um, <coughs> which through communities do enumeration and mapping, um, is, is an incredibly important supplement to, to other forms of data gathering that, that exist. Um, a view of an informal settlement from remote sensing uh, from the air is very different to, to a view on the ground. And, and those two perspectives uh, need to come together and, and support each other. So our students need to know how to do both. Um, and, and the data is important. Uh, thank you both um, <coughs> for the very enlightening talks. Uh, my name is Johanan Bekalat. I'm a student of urban planning at UCL. Um, and uh, my question was, uh, I was born and raised in Ethiopia, Abdis, and um, I want to know what the role of uh, the diaspora is um, in, in the future of urban planning. Um, on the continent, um, <coughs> part of that. Thank you. Uh, actually, I would uh, have asked that question to you. <laughs> 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 because you are the one who is here, and what opportunities you see. Uh, uh, clearly, of course, uh, if you go to Addis today, you see a lot of uh, development. The city is really, uh, you know, sprouting with the high-rise buildings. Uh, a lot of that development is, uh, you know, diaspora uh, resources coming in. The same thing, you go to uh, cities uh, like the Endoret in Kenya. 
uh, the Kenyan runners, when they come home, they build, uh, you know, major, major developments in uh, Android uh, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, so I think uh, this is something we, uh, we, we think, uh, and it, in a way it has a <coughs> uh, lack of uh, direct uh, investments from other sources. Um, the, the challenge, of course, has been always, uh, you know, is it only targeting very small, narrow uh, consumer group, or is it able to address these broader issues of informality, issues of, uh, you know, urban poverty, uh, and, and so forth. So I guess uh, it will require greater organization of people in the diaspora to begin also prioritizing development uh, and see where there are opportunities to do more meaningful development uh, and investments, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Neil Blackshaw, I'm an independent planning consultant uh, in this country. Um, I, I was kind of surprised that neither of you mentioned health in your presentations. It, it doesn't appear as a theme in um, your your approach, and you, Peter, didn't mention it. And yet the um, the burden of disease from un badly managed urban development is, is absolutely enormous and uh, of a quite scandalous uh, dimension. Whether that's within cities where uh, as a result of traffic and road accidents and so on and so forth or whether it's an informal settlement because of lack of sanitation uh, lack of access to water <coughs> and so on and yet health is a very very powerful <coughs> I would suggest uh, organizing principle for better spatial planning and i wondered whether you'd comment on that and say whether you see there's a synergy there uh, whether you're addressing that uh, and whether that might bring in because um, there are a multitude of international agencies from the WHO downwards who are, are investing in health, but there is no confluence between, a, a very weak confluence between spatial planning interventions and health interventions. Okay. No, you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a critical factor. Um, and I think the way planners and planning education comes at it uh, very often is, is through the question of services and sanitation and water in particular and the, the kind of impacts that can have. Um, so I, I, think, I think planners are probably seeing themselves as, as being able to impact in the, through the provision of services. But there's another whole set of thinking about, about health in cities, um, and a lot of that which has, has developed in the global north, and it's how do you plan healthy cities. Um, and a lot of, of, of that work is, is more about walkability uh, and so on. And I think it's been a little bit difficult to try and tie that body of thinking uh, through to, to the African context. There's, there's certainly some schools that, that are trying to do that. Um, there are some schools that, that are picking up on health as a, as a research area. Um, but I think it's, it's largely through the, the, services, uh, the services angle. Just add to that. I think... Uh, I, I tried to talk about uh, sanitation. Uh, I didn't really link it directly with health, but uh, I think the current field in planning is trying to reconnect with health because planning was born out of uh, really concerns of health. Uh, but over time, uh, that health link kind of got cut, uh, if you look at it. It got cut because uh, theories which I think had linked planning with health kind of became uh, not that so important uh, when they focus more on bacteria and uh, immunization. Therefore, you didn't think, uh, you, didn't, you don't have to worry about, uh, uh, you know, that it is a cause of disease. It's a cause, it's caused, caused by bacteria. And if you can immunize it, then you don't need to worry about where a person is staying. Uh, because you remember the book, book of, um, you know, the, by Snow, uh, Snow uh, this book on, what, what, is it, what is it called? It's a very famous book which talk, uh, talks about the, the, the map. Uh, yeah. yeah, and there, there was an argument that uh, disease was due to uh, either smell or it was due to uh, co conduct, conduct conduct theory. But I think the argument of uh, bacteria kind of broke the link but we are trying to really reconnect because uh, it is the opportunities which are created, like for example in informal settlements. When you look at a situation like this, uh, the, we, we measure the disease uh, frequencies, they are very high. Um, we, we look at uh, issues of crime, 
uh, and they are all linked up to uh, actually this connection. So I, I believe that uh, it is an area which uh, planning schools are now beginning to reconnect. I was struck by two things. Thank you for your presentations. First of all, I think, Professor Watson, you showed that 62% of the urban populations live in the settlements. And Professor Miguel, you spoke of a lady who said the latrine was more important than the vote. And that a vote only every four or five years one can understand that why she makes that, that comparison. But the numbers of people living in informal settlements constitute potentially a hugely significant electoral force. Is there any evidence that people vote or vote differently <coughs> and whether they are organizing themselves on the basis of their conditions of life and using their influence in that way? Yeah, I, I th uh, when, you, when you look, we understand, we study the the people in the informal settlements. We actually uh, realize how it's a very highly diverse population. Uh, not everybody living in informal settlements is uh, unemployed. Not everybody is uh, poor. You have uh, people who own the structures. For example, in Kenya, the informal settlements are highly commercialized uh, affair. The, the structures which the poor live are not owned by the poor. They are owned by fairly well, you know, wealthy people. Some of them live in the informal settlement, others live outside. Then the, the control of the informal settlement is through cartels. And a lot of them are part of these voting blocks, which the politicians uh, develop to hold control of the vote in the informal settlement. So actually the, the sensitization of the people in the informal settlement to see the challenge as you know, constituting and the, the, the opportunity of coming from how they use their vote uh, becomes defeated. One, because of this highly uh, you know, uh, influenced uh, pattern of how they behave, how they act. Uh, you notice every time before any election, there is always a lot of you know, evictions, there's a lot of, uh, you, you know, uh, hostilities in the informal settlement. This is because these cartels, these uh, groups, syndicates, they know who is trying to, to support who. And they make sure that uh, those who are against their uh, political masters are removed from that informal settlement. For example, Kibera becomes a very different place approaching elections. Madere becomes a very different place. They sort themselves, themselves out by this particular gun. So that, that's the challenge uh, you, know, you have. Uh, you actually wonder why don't they speak in one voice? Uh, and it is because of this fragmentation which is really driven from uh, these higher interests. Yeah. I think your point is quite relevant <coughs> in South Africa at the moment. We have a general election coming up probably in May next year. Uh, in Cape Town we have the opposition party in control and the last few months have seen the emergence of what is now called the toilet wars. And uh, it's uh, basically what you're talking about. It's communities organizing themselves um, very often by the ruling party um, to, to protest. And it's, it's around toilets <coughs> every time. That seems to be the, the, the absolutely key <coughs> issue. So it's used in different ways by, by both parties, um, the party in power. Uh, continually pointing out how many toilets they've delivered, and the opposition party um, getting their supporters onto the streets to claim that those toilets are not there and they need more. So the sanitation has become a highly political aspect of, of, of life in, in cities, I think it's, a, it's a across the board. <coughs> I'm Neha, I'm from the University of Reading. Uh, my question is sort of slightly related to the last question. Um, you spoke of barriers in the administrative level and in the legislative level. I was wondering, <coughs> in your approach, do you come across barriers from within the community? See, because of you know conflicts, because of um, uh, identities of religion, of gender, etc. And uh, how do you how do you train your students to um, deal with such barriers? That was one question. And the other question was, in your um, 
collaborations. Do you um, learn from or see the possibility of working with the other rest of the global south, say South Asia or Latin America? Within the communities, uh, as I've said, communities are very diverse in the informal settlements. We have uh, the structure owners uh, who have in interest because they really benefit from owning the structures which they rent. Then you have the tenants. 92% uh, <coughs> of the people living in informal settlements, we know they are tenants. Only you know about 12% uh, are structure owners. All the other structure owners are outside. And there are also subtenants within the, the informal settlement. So when you are really dealing with the work in informal settlement, basically, uh, especially when we work with the civil society, <coughs> who are more interested in how to bring services, uh, this is where the, the, the you know the challenges come in. Because how do the structure owners view these kind of interventions? They might think that uh, the aim is to actually dispossess their structures. So initially they will uh, ob object. They will find a way of trying to uh, to, show, to show that uh, no, no, those are not our priorities at the moment. Uh, the reason why we work with the civil society is they are very good at mobilization. They are very good at education. So again, over years, they end up trying to really understand the community. They try uh, to begin talking with the community to make sure that they understand what is uh, being prioritized here. Uh, we find when the civil society engages through education, through a dialogue, uh, they are able to, uh, to kind of create greater con uh, consensus. Uh, so actually, universities, we really don't deal with more directly. We, we, we really work behind with the, with the civil society, and I know these are some of the things which they face. We have uh, tried to do uh, slum upgrading, uh, you know, plans for Madare. Uh, and I would say three quarters of them have never been you know, implemented because of this opposition. Um, even today, uh, Kenyan government has faced a big challenge in terms of slum upgrading. The efforts of Kenyan government to upgrade Kibera, uh, there has been court cases throughout, uh, again taken by the strata owners and also people from outside who own some of that land. Uh, so these are really barriers which uh, uh, we have now just finished last week uh, national slum upgrading and the prevention policy. And this was through a very consultative process and the idea was trying to address how do you deal with this problem of security of tenure. Because security of tenure is a major challenge in slum upgrading. Uh, when we consulted with the communities throughout the country, we, we saw that the country is moving towards uh, a view that, uh, you know, upgrading can take place with a principle of one household, one structure. Uh, that is very difficult for many people to accept because there are people who own more than 200 structures. Uh, although the land, they are, those structures are actually on government land. Uh, the constitution, the new constitution provides a lot of opportunity and hope. The constitution says government is responsible or is entitled to provide uh, adequate housing, adequate uh, access to water, to sanitation and so forth. We have still not seen how government is going to really fulfill this uh, constitutional uh, requirement. Uh, one of the things which has been written in, the, in one of the uh, policies and the acts is that uh, one, to begin with, all informal settlements which are on uh, public owned land will be regularized, will be formalized. So we are looking forward to how government will translate that kind of provision. Because what that means is uh, the people, instead of being evicted, will have to be given access to that land. But the question is, how do you then uh, distribute that land? Uh, because if you look in terms, of, if you distribute it in terms of people who want the structures, uh, basically actually you are benefiting people who are outside. Because uh, you know, three quarters of the structures are owned by people who are outside, very rich people, politicians, former civil servants, they are the ones who own those structures. So we still have a big, big challenge to face how these constitutional provisions are going to be implemented. Your question about Global South links, which I think are really important. 
Um, so the Association of African Planning Schools is part of a global network of planning school associations which cover the globe, and through that we are able to link to other parts of the world. I think, I think there's, some, there's some very interesting parallels between uh, India and, and Africa. Um, rapid urbanization, the same kind of processes often happening in cities, very similar legal and planning systems put in place through similar colonial routes. Um, the planning profession and planning education in India is in really bad shape, maybe even worse than Africa. So there's not much we can learn in terms of, of, of that. Um, Brazil is the other really interesting uh, country, I think, and there's some amazing innovations in, in planning um, that have come out of Brazil, and I think we keep a very close watch on, on what emerges from there and, and see what we can, we can draw on that. Um, so South-South links are really important. Yeah. I'm just going to take two more from the floor, and then I think it's only fair to put a, a drink of some sort in the speaker's hands. <laughs> uh, and so anyone else who would like to speak to them can then uh, uh, come up to them once they're so equipped. Um, the gentleman here, and, and you after that. Thank uh, you. Christopher George, I'm chairman of the Global Innovation Alliance in the city of Norwich in Panama. Um, uh, I, I've been working all over Latin America and Caribbean for over 20 years. I think a lot of the problems, uh, I also studied African politics at university, um, but I, um, I think a lot of the problems that we experience in the world are very, a lot of common issues, and I think knowledge sharing should be something that should be encouraged. Um, the City of Knowledge in Panama has a huge digital conference centre which can connect to six countries at the same time. And uh, I think there definitely should be much more collaboration between countries. I mean, what we specialize in is sustainable construction, water waste management, renewable energy, and what's called group consciousness, uh, which is working with communities through the UN on uh, programs. So um, we'll be very interested to talk to you, see what technology, uh, in fact, on the toilet side, I, I spent last week at the agricultural, the rural technology show. Um, there was only, at about 500 companies, there was only one company in Britain who was doing business in Africa. Um, I, I, and the technology I saw was so outstanding, including toilets for agriculture. Um, you know, <laughs> Britain has a lot of technology here which we can take around the world. Um, I think we're, just, we're, we're really just starting at the moment. Thank you very much. I think it would be better if you connected <coughs> afterwards and carried on and... Um, than, uh, unless you want to respond <coughs> immediately. <coughs> you, you're... Uh, David. David Simon from Royal Holloway, University of London, and it's great to hear positive news out of African planning schools and the planning profession at last, after decades of many of us arguing precisely for that and getting nowhere at all, so well done. My question, though, is um, we've spoken a lot, and rightly so, about informality and how to incorporate um, and, and think more progressively about it and everything that it represents, but Perhaps slightly surprisingly, there's been nothing said tonight yet about indigenous um, planning and architectural and construction uh, traditions, which are very important in certain parts of the continent. So I was wondering in that sort of context, and also in, in terms of your model master's program, what role you see going into the future for uh, encouraging, sustaining, perhaps even reviving indigenous traditions, which of course are not generally informal, they're often highly codified, but according to different norms, laws, regulations, precepts, values, from those that underpin the sort of Western uh, tradition that, again, dominates the profession and the practice. It's a very difficult question. In the region I come from, East Africa, uh, the urbanization has two characters. One is a coastal area, uh, which uh, is associated with the soil culture, and uh, it, uh, I think, uh, you know, predates the colonial period. Uh, so we have soil uh, architecture there and planning. Uh, but the inland of uh, East Africa, uh, I think urbanization is a very recent uh, phenomenon. I, I would not uh, think there is much about, uh, you know, traditional uh, urban you know, architecture, in, uh, but there is traditional settlement uh, architecture in uh, Africa, and some of my colleagues have been uh, 
uh, working on that, especially trying to look at uh, the principles which uh, underlie the, the settlement uh, organization of the Maasai, uh, the settlement organization of the other communities. Just one of my colleagues has just finished a PhD uh, when he were, where he was looking at the, the uh, housing design for among the Kikuyu and uh, looking at uh, the way organization of uh, both the space and also the, the structures was actually based on these uh, principles. Uh, again, going back to the, the law which we have said is a very uh, uh, strong uh, challenge in Africa. Uh, you know, we have building codes which don't allow for uh, traditional building materials. Uh, I, you know, I get very surprised when I find uh, people in uh, Western countries building with wood. That would not be accepted in, uh, in Nairobi because the building code says what materials you should you should really use, and these are like stone and uh, and hard things. So we have not reformed. That's those are some of the things we are talking about uh, challenges of uh, uh, legislation uh, and the, the the specification of materials. One of my I, I think one of the members of the audience is uh, Mr. Adam Maura. There is an architect. And they will give you a bigger story about how, as an architect in Nairobi, it is very difficult for uh, for for them to think in terms of traditional African building materials or traditional building uh, systems. Yeah. David, I'm aware of a couple of West African schools that uh, that do pick up your your question in terms of, of research, but. Let me shift that slightly, and in the same way that, that health is probably a, a gap in terms of our thinking about what should be in a curriculum, and as is crime and violence, which is another important issue, um, the whole question of conservation and heritage is, is often another big gap in our curricula. Um, and uh, I've been struck particularly recently about stories in, in Dar es Salaam, where the private sector is moving in and the glass boxes are going up. Um, and uh, demolition of buildings that are not, not indigenous by any means, but are, are, are quite valuable and are probably 50, 60, 70 years old, are being demolished to make way for, for the new tower blocks um, with, with absolutely no concern about um, preservation, conservation, uh, and so on. So, so I think, uh, not from the deep history, but even from more recent history, um, I think we do need to think how to to bring those aspects into curriculum as well. Uh, on behalf of all of us at ARI and the speakers, I'd just like to thank all of you, and not only for coming, but also for the really excellent questions and comments. <coughs> and do please stay and, uh, and address further points to the speakers. And... Um, a final word of thanks from me to you both. It's been a real privilege having you here. And um, yes, I feel we're all very fortunate. Thank you.